welcome to the meeting in English. We know that, you know, in heaven, everyone speaks Spanish. But for those of us that still speak English here on the earth, it's a joy to bring you this word. Um, you, you heard about these, uh, these two guys that are good friends, and they were arguing in the car. And one was a black guy, and the other was a white guy. And they were arguing, is Jesus white or black? And they got into such an argument about it, they crashed into a tree, and they both died, and they went to heaven. And they, you know, they got their interview with Peter, and they, they said, hey, hey, Peter, we were arguing on the way up here. Uh, is Jesus white or black? And Peter says, well, here he comes. You can ask him yourself. And then so here comes Jesus, and he says, Hola, amigo, que tal? Como estas? <laughs> bueno, yes, we know that Jesus is paisa. The second letter of Peter, not the second wife, the second epistle, chapter one. That's all we're going to look at today, but it's a lot. I know uh, we all kind of like Peter, you know, because we can identify with him. He's so impulsive and uh, he just, you know, things just came out of his mouth. And he, he had the, the foot and mouth disease. We can identify with Peter. Yeah, I'll follow you, Jesus. Cockle doodle do. But Peter had a faith that grew. And it's so amazing. We know so much about the life of Peter that we don't pay much attention to the very last letter that Peter left us. It was about the year 67 or 68. We're not sure when he wrote it. But it was, might have been months before he was killed. He was in a Roman jail. He knew he was going to die. And he knew exactly how he was going to die because Jesus told him in John 21, verse 8, it says, Peter, when, you, you know, when you're young, you could do what you want, but when you're older, you've got to extend your hands and they're going to tie you up and take you where you don't want to go. <laughs> well, where's the place Peter didn't want to go? To the cross. But now years later, he's in Rome and he's in jail and he's ready to go to the cross. And you know, according to pretty historical uh, backed legend is that when he came to the cross he says I can't be crucified like my Lord I'm not worthy please crucify me upside down and they did but here's uh, Peter's last words he's trying to put together in a short letter everything he that he learned in life walking with Jesus so that we would take our faith seriously and here it is. All right, let's even do better. Let's just kind of go in our imagination in a time machine. And let's just say that you're allowed to have a visit, only about 20 minutes, with Peter in jail. And you arrive there and you say, Peter, wow, I don't mean to take much of your time. But, um, you know, um, I just want to get a few words uh, advice from you of how we can, you know, take our faith more seriously and grow and, and you know, the church in Medellin. What, what's the name of the city? Medellin. Okay. You want to know something? Yeah. Look here in chapter 1 and verse 1. Now look what it says. He, Peter, then he presents himself. Let's read it. Simon Peter Oh, I've got it in the wrong language. I don't have it in the language of heaven. Let me get the King James. Oh, here it is. Simon Peter, a servant apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied. So Peter's telling you in the jail, hey, you know the faith you got right there? It's the same faith, precious faith, that I have, that John had, that uh, James had, and it works. 
But the problem with some Christians is they take their faith and they put it in the refrigerator. It's not made for that. You got to take it out every day and you got to cultivate it. You got to add some ingredients. And I'm going to give you seven ingredients today that will make your faith pop. You just can't say, oh, I got faith, amen, and that's it. And I'm going to show you. So write this down. Seven ingredients that you must add to your faith. You must mix in your faith. Now write this down. I, you're going to remember it. Number one, we'll come back to this. Virtue. Two, knowledge. Three, self-control. Ha! Maybe you're thinking, Peter, who's talking? You're going to tell us about self-control. Give me a break. After self-control, patience, piety, and then fraternal, love, and then God kind of love, agape. Now just remember that because, the, and here's Peter talking to you, because so many Christians don't know they need to add these seven ingredients to their faith. They, they think that all they have to do is uh, go into the Christian factory, let's Hey, Peter, how do you know about a factory? You didn't have any factories back then. Oh, well, I saw it in a vision. Okay. Let's say here's the, the church, and it's like a factory producing people with a great life, a great faith that make a difference in the world because they got virtue, knowledge, self-control, patience, piety, fraternal love, and agape. So the people come in here all depressed, and then they go through the factory. What's in the factory? You learn how to pray. You learn how to go to church. You get involved in a small group. You read the Word. You confess the Word, and you learn how to do all this stuff, and you learn how to pray, and you fast, and you learn how to give. Okay, but that's, that's the factory. That's not what we're producing. What Jesus is producing through the faith are people of these things. Oh, well, Peter, then teach me about those seven things. He says, not yet. Now read with me in verse 12. This is Peter talking to us. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you already know them, but I want you to be established in this truth. And I think it's good, as long as I'm with you in this body, to stir you up by the way of remembrance, knowing that surely I must put off this body, even as the Lord Jesus has showed me. So I will be diligent that you may be after, after I die, that you can have these things, that you can have chapter 1 in Second Peter. Years ago, I remember... When T.L. Osborne, the great evangelist, came to Medellin, he was talking to a group of pastors. And this was about a year after his wife, Daisy, died. Now, T.L. Osborne, I think he might, I know he's in his mid-80s. And he said, brothers, it's really hard for me to travel. I really hate traveling now that my wife is not with me. At my age, I deserve to be home in my comfortable house, maybe doing some writing and planting tomatoes. And then he began to cry. He says, but I have to be here to give you what God has given me. And Peter is saying the same thing. I'm leaving I'm out of here. I'm going to be crucified, but I've got to get these things to you. Now, let me tell you what happens. If you start adding 
these seven ingredients to your faith, look what it says in verse 11. There will be open to you a wide and generous door into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? There's going to be a door open. But we're saved. Yeah, but there's no real open door between you and the kingdom, between you and the supernatural. Many Christians just have a little people of light. Oh, oh, oh. I know that the kingdom's there. I received Jesus. But, and some Christians only stick a finger through that. There's a little hole, and they stick their finger out, and they, oh, oh, I feel that. Oh, it's something wonderful there. And I, maybe other Christians have a bigger hole, and they can stick their head in and say, oh, man, look at the glory, the peace, the, the miracles, the, oh, this is wonderful. But God, as he did in my life, he wants you to have a big door where every day you can walk into the glory, into the kingdom, and come out to the people in need and give them healing. Like I did in the book of Acts. There was a man paralyzed for 38 years. And he got up because I came from the presence in the name of Jesus. And there was a young girl named Dorcas. She was dead and I was in the glory I came through the door and came out through the door and I said Dorcas get up little girl and she did and I was walking down Main Street Jerusalem and people were getting healed as my shadow passed over them not because I'm anything but I was under the shadow of the all-powerful God and God wants your life he wants you to take your faith seriously and with your faith, he's going to open the door. But you've got to add these seven ingredients. Are you ready to learn them? Yes, Peter, that's what I came from. Tell me, explain them to me. Not yet. In verse 16, till the end of the chapter, Peter, says, he relates, he says, let me tell you an experience I had. Okay. I was on the mountain of transfiguration when Jesus, his face was, was the, had the glory of the sun. I mean, it was brilliant. And then the cloud of the Holy Spirit just came over me, just as the cloud's coming over you now. And then I heard the voice of the Father talking to the Son. I mean, I was right in the middle of the conversation with the Trinity, the Holy Trinity. The Father was talking to the Son, and the Holy Spirit was around us, and, and I was there. I heard his voice, and I'm telling you, what he said just rocked my life. It changed me. But let me show you something. Let me show you something. I know you're thinking, well, I would have liked to be there. Verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter was saying, that was beautiful to hear the voice of the Father, but the scriptures which you have in your lap, in your hand, on your iPhone, is the word even more sure. Where you do well to really pay attention as unto a light, or unto a, like a lantern that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rises in your heart. You know what he's saying? He's okay, like me right now in this jail, I'm in a dark place. But I'm paying attention to the lamp of the word. And you might be in a dark place. Your family might be a dark place. Your business might be a dark place. You might live in a neighborhood that's dark. But if you honor and pay attention to the word more sure that's in this holy book, the light that begins to shine in your heart will begin to shine in your house or in your business. I wonder, which, which barrio in Medellin is going to be the first barrio that will be totally flooded in light, will be transformed 
to be the first barrio of many that will be transformed in this city. Okay, Peter, 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 please. I don't have much time. Can you please explain to me how to make my faith grow so all this can happen? Okay. You got to have your faith. You believe in Jesus. But look how it starts. Let's go back. Verse 3. According to his divine power... He's already given to us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. Okay. This word here is also godliness. But he's saying from the very beginning two things we already have. Life and it's um, zoe life in Greek and godliness or piet, piety. Now look at these two things. He's saying from the very beginning, this faith is that you really enjoy life to the fullness and abundance. I mean, you're talking about healing and health and provision and divine contacts and, and supernatural miracles. And I mean, the life, the family is great. I mean, the, you have influence, life. But also you got to have on the inside godliness, a real reverence, a real devotion, I mean, here's kind of talking about the gifts, the manifest gifts of the Spirit. Here's talking about the deep fruit of your character. And both, both come through the power that's already been given to us, but how? Verse 4. By these precious promises, by that prophetic word, more sure, the B-I-B-L-E. Okay, now, then he goes... Then it goes down to verse 5. So now we got to do, it's a little addition. Now add to your faith. Take it out of the refrigerator. Add to it what's the first thing. Virtue. This is not talking about being a goody two-shoes. You know, like some Christians say, well, since I've been saved, hallelujah, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't dance, I don't chew tobacco, and I don't go out with girls that chew tobacco. Hallelujah, I don't do anything. No, that's not the kind of holiness we're talking about. Well, I mean, we're just talking about moral excellence. When you fulfill your word, you, you go the second mile to help somebody. I mean, do you know someone in your life? I have a few friends that has such a beautiful moral excellence. It's attractive. Religious, um, you know, the uh, religious people that are baptized with lemon juice, they're not attractive, but virtue, nobility, fulfilling your word, it's so attractive. But then Peter says, then you got to add to that knowledge, but personal knowledge. And Peter's still talking. Remember, we're still back in the jail. And Peter says, man, you know, I just got to know Jesus when I was fishing, and that was just the beginning. And then I got to know him in a bigger way that he really did like me. And he could heal sick people, cast demons out. He could raise the dead. And then he died on the cross and totally shocked me. But then I got to know him as the resurrected Lord. And then he sent his Holy Spirit. Oh man, I've been rolling. And, and we have a history together. I mean, you know, I can see where I made steps of progress. I, I remember where I really screwed up and he forgave me. And I have a history. I know him more and more. And when I read the word, I know his heart more. Even sometimes I don't understand what his hand's doing, but I trust his heart because I know him. So you got to add to your faith, moral excellence, and knowledge, and then what comes next? What comes next, Peter? Self-control. Peter, you're telling us about self-control. You who cut the ear off, the slave of the high priest, give me a break. And Peter says, no, you don't know. I've got self-control now. Because if I didn't, I'd punch you in the nose for what you just said. He said, I, I kind of remember that precious promise that Paul gave uh, to that young Timothy saying, you know, God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power and self-control. I believe that word. It was a seed planted in my heart. And 
I now have self-control. My emotions, my anger, my fear, they don't carry me around like a rag doll in the, in the mouth of a bull terrier. I got self-control. I don't have control over other people. God just wants to give me control over myself. Then what else, Peter? Well, patience. I'm not going to say anything, Peter. I just look, reading about your life in the, in the Gospels doesn't look like you had a lot of patience. You're right, I didn't. But have you read about me in the book of Acts? How I, I didn't have to feel worried or anxious. I just waited on the Lord and God opened the door to reach the Gentiles, sent me supernaturally to Cornelius' house because I was just waiting. Patience is an impatience kind of control. Patience is... You just know God's working behind the, the curtains in your favor. And he opened that door. He gave me direction. And then in chapter 12, if you read how I was in jail and King Herod was going to cut my head off, and I was just patient. I didn't know what God was going to do. But he sent an angel and opened me a door. And now I have a life of patience. And patience gives me guidance and opens doors that no man can open. Wow, Pedro. And what's the fifth thing? Godliness or piety. That means I just have such an ambition way down deep. I don't know how I got there. It's just that I love Jesus and I just want to please him. I used to be so afraid of man and what he thought, but now I just have the beautiful fear of the Lord and I love people, but I don't give a rip what they think. Okay, Peter tells this young man, you. Do you remember those five things? Okay, virtue, personal knowledge, <laughs> self-control, patience, <laughs> and godliness. Okay, you got those down? Write them down. Because they're going to be seeds. They're going to grow in the garden of your life. Okay. But take this back to Medellin. If you don't have the last two, the first five is baloney. You've got to have a real affection for other Christians. Not, not this, this su superficial, oh, I love you by faith. Hallelujah. No, no. How you doing, brother? Oh, bendecido, glorificado, en, en hit la bendis. No, no, no. Sentir un afecto. Mira. Es un regalo, dice Pedro, de sentir como una amistad profunda con Juan y, y, y James and Matthew. Before I was in competition with him trying to make Jesus think I was better than them, but that all changed when I got this, this affection. But there's got to be more. There's got to be also God's kind of love, zoe. I mean, it's Peter Dawn, I got agape kind of love. Uh, do you remember when Jesus first called me? You know, Jesus is the great pastor. And he called me to be a what? A great fisherman. So I was fishing. And he says, you're going to fish for men's souls. And I said, wow, that's great. And it happened. I preached my first uh, sermon. And 3,000 people came to the Lord. That was a good day fishing. <laughs> but remember after I denied Jesus, I don't want to mention that too much, but I did deny him three times. And then when he rose from the dead, he, he had a little fire and, and I was looking into the fire because I didn't want to look at his face and Jesus says, do you love me? Yeah, I like you. No, Peter, do you love me? Do you, agape, do you love me? Yeah, I like you. Peter, do you love me? And I said, you know, Jesus, you know all things. I'm kind of surprised, but somehow, yes, I do love you. And then, and then Jesus said to me, he said, love my sheep. Agape me sheep. Wait a minute, I'm a fisherman. Fishing's easy. 
Taking care of sheep, that takes a deeper kind of love. You got to put up. You got it, Peter. And you know, for the rest of my life, I lived in this love. I love the sheep. That's it. Peter, one last thing before I go. We had a prophet, David Sylvester, who just last week gave the Comunidad Cristiana de Fe, gave this word to our pastoral team. And it says the next seven years, there will be crazy growth. What do you think about that word? Peter says, yeah, I kind of feel there's some weight to that. Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's going to happen. But that's not what concerns me. What, what do you mean? Oh, it's going to happen. But my concern, will those Christians, what do you call them there in Medellin? Pisces. Ah, will those Pisces have the agape love to take care of all these new sheep? Will they open up their groups? Will they, will they sacrifice? But you know, if you add to your faith virtue and knowledge and self-control and patience and godliness and affection and love, there's going to be a huge door. In Medellin, va a ser, oh, I have to speak in English. Medellin will be like a tourism center for the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Close your eyes and say with me, Father God, thank you for the salvation and the faith that is precious, just like the faith that was in the chest of Peter is in mine. And I want to add to my faith today moral excellence. Forgive me for not taking my faith seriously, but today I do. And I want to add to moral character. I want to add knowledge. I really want to start having a history with you, Jesus. I want to know you, not just what people tell me about you. I want to know you face to face more and more through the word, through my life, through other people. And Father, I want to add to this knowledge self-control because I am tired of being thrown around by my little emotions, getting all upset, bent out of shape. I want to be led by the Spirit. I receive the power, the promise of self-control. I need it. And Father, I pray for patience. So when I'm waiting on things, it's, it's a delight because I know you're working in my favor. And Father, give me this new love for Christians, even when I see that they're not very perfect like me. Give me that supernatural love. And Father, give me that agape love that I can sacrifice what it takes to take care of the thousands of people that are running to Jesus in these next years. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I want to release to you right now, there's a guy here that's uh, from the United States and you've had dental problems and you're right between, should I go to the States or go here for you get my, my problems fixed? But the Lord's going to do a miracle in your mouth to let you know that he's called you to speak his prophetic words with your mouth. Also, that fear that the cancer will come back is a lie. And the power of the resurrection is flowing in your body. And I'm, I'm getting uh, the word Carolina. And uh, I just, here's what I have. I just feel that your heart is in the hand of the Lord. And the Lord is saying, will you decide to go 100% with me and I will turn all my favor on you. Now, if you're listening to me and, you know, you, you've 
I mean, you grew up in a Christian home and you kind of, kind of, kind of believe, you know, that that's not enough. You've got to uh, really open up. You know, you've ever had anybody say, hey, come on, open up, be real. You've got to be real with Jesus. And you've got to make some business today and say, Jesus, I, I've uh, kind of believed you, but you're not running my life. And I make the decision. I repent from my sinful, selfish, stinking life. And I open up for you to cleanse me, fill me with your good Holy Spirit, and come and rule on my heart as my Lord and Savior. If you just made that prayer and you're serious, touch the link in the chat and uh, we'll, we will... Uh, We'll be getting back to you. We'll be praying with you. May the Lord bless you richly in ways you've never experienced it before. In the name of the love of the Father, in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and with the friendship of the Holy Spirit, I love you and I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.